Amen. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock of our salvation. Amen. Amen. Let us pray, saints of God. Blessed God, we do thank you and we praise you for another opportunity to be in your house, another opportunity for worship, another opportunity, O oh God, to lift up your name and to give you praise. And now, Heavenly Father, we pray, O oh Lord, that your presence would fill this place, that, Heavenly Father, your anointing, that yoke-destroying, burden-lifting anointing would fall fresh in this house. Spirit of the living God, you're welcome here. This is your house. And so, oh God, we pray that you would have your way, that you would be glorified amidst your people, and that, Heavenly Father, that we would be transformed because we have been in your presence. Have your way, O oh God, today. And we will be so careful to give your name the praise, honor, and glory. For it is in Jesus' mighty name we do pray. Amen and amen. Saints of God, if you would turn with us or, um, or see our screens. And as we're standing together, lifting our voices in one as one, lifting our voices together, let us sing this great hymn of the church. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Needless pains we bear, all because everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Have we trials and temptation? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to Can we find, can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Oh, Jesus knows, just knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? We weak and heavy laden. Comfort with the load of care. Oh, precious Savior. Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. 
do thy friends do thy friends despise for take thee take it to the Lord in prayer in his arms his arms he'll take and shield thee thou shall find a solace there. Amen. What a blessing to know that we have a friend in Jesus, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, a friend that is so faithful that when mother and father forsakes us, it is the Lord that will take us up. And so, saints of God, we know that we can go to the Lord, our friend in prayer. And I'm going to ask Reverend Fogel to prepare herself for this time of prayer. And certainly, again, uh, there is always something and someone to lift up in prayer. We're certainly praying for the church family in its entirety. We're praying for uh, you, um, our visitors, and also our friends. We're praying for all of those that we have mentioned that have lost loved ones in this season. We pray for God's comfort and God's peace for your heart and for your soul. Uh, also, um, asking for prayer um, for a good friend of Brother Justin, Gino. Uh, we talked to Justin on last week. Um, and his friend was rushed to the hospital, and so we want to lift Gino up in your prayers. Um, also, we found out on this morning that uh, Sister Nanny Gillespie's nephew, Donald Simpson, went home to be with the Lord. And so we are lifting up uh, Sister Nanny and also um, the whole family in our prayers, as well as Sister Cleo Williams, uh, who... I went back to a rehab um, in Hackensack, and thank you um, uh, for Deacon Acri uh, for letting me know about um, those members. I'm also asking for prayer for my family as well. Uh, we have experienced uh, death twice this week. Um, uh, my great aunt who was the matriarch of the family uh, my grandmother's only surviving sibling went home to be with the Lord on last week at the age of 105 and she was one of the most joyous saints that I had ever met and so this is a major loss for our family um, unfortunately it was not able uh, to get to her home going it was on yesterday and we just found out, but just um, keep, keep us in your prayers. Also, um, keep my cousin Re in your prayers as well. We found out on this way that her husband went home to be with the Lord. And again, uh, there was not time for us uh, to travel, uh, to go down and to um, honor his life. And so um, we're just asking for prayers of comfort for my family uh, on both sides, um, that God will keep us and hold us and would comfort us and would assure us, that, assure us, again, that our loved ones that have died in the Lord, we will see them again if we are in Christ. Reverend Fogel, come and lead us in this time of prayer. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Father God, your word declares that it makes no difference what the problem is, that we can always take it to you, Father God. Father God, we thank you for this morning, Father God, that you woke us up, Father God, in our right mind, Father God. We thank you this morning that we have activities of our limbs, Father God. We have homes to go to, Father God. We have food on the table, Father God. We can walk, we can talk, we can move, breathe, and have our being in you, Lord Jesus. So, God, we say thank you, Lord. 
Thank you for the opportunity to pray, Father God, and to call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, and our King. Father God, we know that you are our refuge and our fortress, our God in whom we trust, Father God. And Father God, we know that no matter what the situation, the trial, or the circumstances, we can come to you, Father God, and lay it before the altar, Father God. We thank you right now in the name of Jesus, Father God, because in your word you said, Father God, that you, Father God, will hear us, that you will never forsake us, Father God, and that if we bring it to you, Father God, that you will bear it, Father God. So here we are once again, casting our burdens on you, Lord Jesus, because we know, Father God, there's strength in you, Father God, there's strength in your word, Father God, and each and every time, when we come across a situation that we can't handle, Father God, we can call on Jesus. We can call on your mighty name, Father God. You said call upon me and that you would answer us. You'll be with us in trouble. You'll deliver us and you'll honor us with long life and with your salvation. So, Lord God, here we are once again, Father God, calling upon the name of Jesus. Hear us, O oh Lord Jesus, as we cry out for help, Father God. Hear us, Father God, as we bring before you, Father God, the sick and the shut-in, Father God. Hear us, Father God, as we bring before you the jobless, Father God, the unemployed, Father God, the underemployed, Father God, those, Father God, who have given up hope. Hear us, O oh God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Father God, you said that you uphold us with your righteous right hand, Father God. That you're with us, Father God, in trials and in tribulations, Father God. You said that you never leave us nor forsake us. So here we are, Father God. Lord God, I thank you because you're a God who never slumbers. You never sleep, Father God. So Father God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that we hold fast to that word, Father God, because some of us are losing hope. Some of us are losing, Father God, faith. But Father God, we know that we have to continue to hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering because you, God, are able to keep your promise Lord God, I thank you for being a promise keeper, Father God, a way maker, Father God. You've made ways out of no ways, Father God. And when we prayed to you, Father God, in the past, you answered us, Father God. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now that we will remember that, Father God. That we, you, we remember that you are the same God, that if you did it before. You can do it again, Father God. So I pray right now in the name of Jesus that we walk by faith and not by sight, Father God. That we look to the hills from which cometh our help, knowing that our help comes from you, Father God. Knowing that you are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? You're the strength of our life. Of whom shall we be afraid? So Lord God, we come before you this morning, Lord Jesus, asking you to please be patient with us, Father God. Because we know you're not through with us yet, Father God. And you're going to answer maybe not the way we want to be answered. But, Father God, we know that you're a promise keeper and that you will answer our prayers. So we're going to hold on just a little while longer, Father God. Even though the enemy tells us that you don't hear us. Even though the enemy tells us that you're not going to answer. Lord God, we know in the name of Jesus that your word declares that you will, Father God because you said to call upon you, Father God, so here we are. Lord Jesus, I pray right now for every person who's present today, Lord Jesus. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that whatever they're praying for, Father God, that you will, Father God, answer them. That there will be deliverance, Father God. That there will be restoration, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. I pray for those, Father God, who have not accepted your gift of salvation, Father God. I pray for their souls right now in the name of Jesus. I pray for our children, Father God. Those who are lost, those that the world is telling that there is no God. God, Father God, but we know, Father God, that you are the creator of heaven and earth, Father God. You rule and super rule the universe, Father God. And Father God, all we have to do is trust you and obey you, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you for this time that you've given to each and every one of us. Father God, I pray a blessing upon all of us right now in the name of Jesus. Whatever we're holding on to, Father God, let us surrender it right now to Jesus because he's ready to take it up. Stop holding on to it. Surrender it and let God have his way. Let him move by his spirit. Let him move by his ways. 
And Father God, we'll be so careful to give thy name the praise, the glory, and the honor because your will is going to be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend Fogel, for leading us in that time of prayer. Um, it is so good to see each and every one of you, and we're so glad to see the church family as well as our visitors. And so I'm going to ask uh, Sister Joyce Wooten to come again. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Sister Joyce, come and welcome our visitors and greet our family members again. Amen. Good morning, Ebenezer family. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord one more time. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's walk by faith and not by sight. Do we have any visitors today? You can raise. Oh, thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for coming to worship with us. We hope you enjoy the service, and we hope you come back again. You know, during the COVID, what we do today. So we're going to give some love to our ushers in the back. We're going to give some love to little Sydney and Sister Lauren and Brother Raymond. Are you in there? <laughs> we're going to give each other some Let's each of those to the left and to the right. Let's give some love to our music ministry. Let's give some love to our men in the choir that's singing so godly this morning. Let's give some love to our Reverend Fogel. Let's give some love to our pastor. And if y'all got just a little bit left for me, I accept it with the love of the Lord. Thank you, and have a blessed day. Amen. Thank you, Sister Joyce, for that welcome. And I'm, I'm just so grateful. I see some of my seniors here from Bergen Family Center and some other people. Um, it's such a blessing to have you here on today, and I'm just thankful um, for all of you being here. Uh, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, we are going to have a, a selection, but it's going to be a musical selection uh, from our uh, music department. And so uh, can y'all put your hands together and bless God for our wonderful, skilled musicians. Amen.
Good morning, church. Can you hear me? Okay. Good morning, church. Reminder, please silence all cell phones on the service. Thank you. Church office hours are Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. The Word on Wednesday Bible study will resume September 18th at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. We will begin studying the book of 1 Peter. All members are encouraged to attend. Join the men's ministry every Friday at 7 p.m. as they gather to study the Word of God and fellowship at the church. The Bergen County Black Caucus will hold a voter engagement meeting here at Ebenezer Baptist Church on Tuesday, September 17, 2024, at 7 p.m. Keynote speaker will be Assimile ben Benji Wimley. Wimley, okay. Refreshments will be served at 6.30 p.m. Come out and learn how you can become involved voter engagement efforts. We will celebrate the seventh anniversary of Pastor and People. <laughs> on September 22nd, 2024, the theme is Partner for the Good Work of the Gospel, which is in Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Guest preacher for the 1015 a.m. morning service will be Pastor John Gooden Sr. of Repair Center Ministries of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The guest preacher for a 4 p.m. service will be Bishop Billison Hunter of the Cathedral Baptist Worship Center of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Let us come together and celebrate God's goodness and grace these seven years, amen? Save the date. The Fellowship of Black Churches of Hackensack and Vicinity is hosting their annual Pastors and Leader Conference on Saturday, September 12th, I'm sorry, October 12th, 2024, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Mount Olive Baptist Church in Hackensack. Guest presenters include Reverend Maria Crompton, Reverend Dr. Lester Taylor Jr., Reverend Dr. Danielle Brown, and Reverend Dr. Jerry Carter Jr. Registration is $40. They're requesting that we register as soon as possible so they can see the interest. Everyone should have received a text message with the flyer. If you do not receive it, please see Pastor to register. Sunday, October 20th, 2024, we will celebrate Men's Day at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Details to follow. Amen. Our 2024 theme is we focus, we commit, we build, and rejoice, which is in Ezra chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. We have a card that we received here. You are invited Sunday. 929-2024, 3 p.m. First Presbyterian Church of Inglewood, Sunday, 929-2024, at 3 p.m. Let's celebrate the dedication of our new pipe organ and worship space together. Dress code is smart casual. So if anybody wants to know or see this, just let me know at the church, or I'll post it on the North X. That's on two Sundays from now, 3 p.m. First Presbyterian Church at 3 p.m. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Sister Sabrina, for those announcements. And I certainly want to reiterate um, the meeting uh, that will take place here, um, sponsored by the Black Caucus, Bergen County Black Caucus, um, with uh, the president, uh, Dr. Suzanne Mullins, um, and also in conjunction with uh, James Edmonds and the Sheriff's Department, um, we want to make sure, my brothers and sisters, as I always say, that we're engaged um, in this political process, that our voices are heard, um, and then our needs are met. And so we must, we must, we must uh, hold our elected officials accountable. Uh, if they want our vote, then they need to be able to give us something for our vote. And certainly there are so many things that are needed in this community and in this area, in this county of Bergen County. Um, and so 
Um, I'm admonishing all of you to come out on Tuesday. Uh, bring 185 of your closest friends um, so that we can learn how we can engage in this political process. There's no excuse for anyone that is eligible to vote not to vote. We cannot, we cannot allow apathy to cause us to sit this one out. Because I guarantee you, if we get the wrong person in, the repercussions are not going to pass by you if you sit out to vote. And so we need to make sure uh, that we are diligent, um, that we are engaged, that we are knowledgeable, and um, one of the people that I know and have had the pleasure of meeting uh, that I know uh, will, will uh, inform us of the importance of this is Assemblyman Benji Wimbley, a man of God that has served his community well, has served his community faithfully, that cares about the community. We may not be as familiar with him in Bergen County, uh, but he has done a marvelous work in Passaic County and, and more so in the city of Patterson uh, where he grew up. And so, um, saints of God, again, I admonish you to come out um, to uh, get the information that is given and then go out and share it with everybody, everybody that you know, so that our voices can be heard. Amen? Amen, amen. Uh, I'm so excited, and, and I can't believe it's just a week away, but I'm so excited about the celebration of the partnership between pastor and people here at Ebenezer Baptist Church. For seven years, God has had us uh, together. Amen. And we're just so thankful uh, to God for what he has done in these seven years, for the souls that have been saved, for the, uh, uh, the souls that have been added to uh, this body. And so we going to celebrate and we going to have a party. Amen. And I am just so grateful and thankful for uh, the vessels of God that will come and share with us, uh, my friend and my brother, um, and um, one that I have had the privilege, whoo, all right, feel my help. One that I have had the privilege of walking um, this Episcopal journey with, uh, Bishop Designate, uh, Bishop Elect John Gooden, Sr. of the Repair uh, Center Ministries in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania a powerful man of God, and I know he has a word in his mouth for us on that day. And then in the afternoon, uh, the quiet storm is coming. Amen. We know that our mother in the ministry, Bishop Millicent Hunter, uh, will be here with the Baptist Worship Center from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And y'all know, BWC, they roll thick. So you want to be here early to make sure that you get a good seat because I believe the house is going to be packed. We're going to celebrate what God has done. We're going to thank him and give him praise. We're going to have some good, good, good church, and then we're going to go home rejoicing in what God has done and looking forward to what God is going to do in the next seven years here at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And so for all of our visitors, all our friends, and all of the family, invite 185 of your closest friends to come and celebrate with us what the Lord has done, is doing, and will do in the life of this church. Amen? Amen. Okay. Mill Chorus, y'all ready to sing? All right, Mill Chorus, uh, lead us in worship after which we will hear what the Lord has to say to us on today.
to his hand. When everything else around us is shaky and uncertain, we can hold to God's unchanging hand. Amen. Can we put our hands together one more time for our male chorus? There is a word from the Lord today, and as I sought the Lord for what to say to you on today, just his wisdom concerning the word on today, the Lord directed my attention to a very familiar portion of Scripture, very familiar biblical narrative found in the book of Jonah. And I will be starting to read from chapter number 1, verse 17. Then I will continue all the way through chapter 2 in its entirety. The book of Jonah, chapter number 1, verse 17, and then all the way through to chapter number 2, verse number 10. Verse 17 is the last verse in chapter 1, and then we will read chapter number 2 in its entirety. When you have it, stand for the reading and the reverence of God's word if you can. Jonah, the Old Testament book of Jonah, chapter number 1, verse 17. And the word of the Lord reads like this. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And he said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, and yet I look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols... Turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed, and I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Verse number 10, and the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The word of the Lord is already blessed. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Saints of God, if you give me just a few minutes of your time, and then we can all go home and prepare for whatever game is on today. Get your chips and salsa and your wings and all of that good food together. But for a few minutes, how about we partake in some spiritual food? And so, saints of God, I want to title this time of sharing uh, from this text, When God Has to Put You in Time Out. When God has to put you in time out. Let us pray. Blessed God, we do thank you. We do honor you for another opportunity to stand before your people. And, oh, God, even in our inadequacies, you, oh, God, are always adequate, always powerful, always potent, 
And so, blessed Savior, I pray now that by your spirit that lives and dwells in me, that you would preach this word, that your anointing would fall fresh and anew, that, Heavenly Father, my flesh would decrease and die so that you could be glorified through me and in me. We need a word, O oh God. I pray, O oh God, that you would speak. Speak now for your servant hears. In the mighty matchless name of Jesus, the Christ we do pray. Amen and amen. When God has to put you in time out. Different people have different ways of disciplining their children. I know that when I was a young man, and maybe some of you can testify to this as well, I know when I was young, uh, we ain't know nothing about time out. If we did something wrong, it was swift and painful punishment. Now, I know that there are many people, I heard all the made men's, y'all had that testimony too. <laughs> Now, I know there are many people that look at that way of discipline as barbaric and outdated. But that wasn't the only aspect of the type of discipline in my household. My brothers and sisters, I came to tell you today that discipline is not an act. Discipline is a system that establishes rules and norms, expectations, and the consequences uh, for violating those rules. My parents set the parameters for acceptable behavior in our house because they believed in the scripture uh, where it says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. They consistently reiterated the expectations and the consequences of violation. We knew that we uh, were setting, we knew that they were setting these boundaries for us, not out of spite or to hurt us, not to keep us from having fun and not to keep us from doing things, but they were setting these boundaries for us because they loved us and they did not want us to grow up without the structure that we needed to prosper. So when we violated the expectations, we were clear and we understood what the consequences were and why we were experiencing those consequences. God disciplines his children in the same manner. And I know we don't like to talk about God's discipline. We <laughs> Always want, ooh, God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, God's blessings, God's all of those things, God's favor. But God also disciplines us in the same manner. And my brothers and sisters, I think we need another or a different or a clearer perspective on discipline. God disciplines us because he loves us. The Bible tells us, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he abukes, rebukes you because the, Lord's disi the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son or as a child of God. Hebrews uh, chapter number 12, verse, uh, the end part of verse 5 and verse 6. The author of Hebrews, if you uh, take a look at that a little later on when you get home, he describes this passage of Scripture as a word of encouragement for those that are considered by God his children. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the chastening or the discipline of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delight. The Lord chastens us. He corrects us. He, he provides boundaries for us because he loves us, because we are his children, and because we are the apple of his eye and the delight of his heart. I wish I had a witness in here. 
the correction of the Lord, signifies that we belong to him, that we bear his name, that he loves us, and that he delights in us. Sometimes God has to put his disobedient children in time out. Anybody ever been in time out with the Lord? We amongst family, you can raise your hand, it's all right. We ain't going to judge you, because you see mine as well. You see mine up? Amen. You in good company if you've ever experienced the time out of the Lord. What is the time out of the Lord? Well, uh, for those of you who may have grown up in a, in a household different from mine, where this message of discipline was used, this is what the parents who believed in time out would do. Uh, uh, this method of discipline requires that they would send their children to a place or a specific location in the house. And that location would be void of their games, void of their toys, or any other activity uh, that they may enjoy. Uh, they would be in that location, and they would be in that location alone. Uh, they are in solitude, and the instructions that many of the parents that believed in this type of discipline would give would be that they were to remain there a certain period of time to Think about what you've done. Sometimes God has to put his children in time out so that we can think about what we've done. Because, my brothers and sisters, we have violated his will. And I'm not referring to a corner of the house where uh, we are forced to stare at a blank wall. Uh, I I'm not speaking of that because we grown. But I'm speaking of a spiritual place of confinement where we cannot move forward. Uh, I, I'm speaking of a place that God puts us in where it seems like everything around us is dead and unfruitful and unproductive. I'm thinking of a place where it seems like as much as we try to get out of it, we are caught in it and we cannot move. That's God's time out. But my brothers and sisters, I'm hoping that if you've ever been in God's time out or if you will ever be in God's time out, I pray that this message will encourage you and also instruct you as to what to do when you find yourself in God's time out. And so what do we do when God puts us in time out? Well, if we go to the text and the story of Mr. Jonah, our instructor for this time, this is the scenario that Jonah finds himself in in the text. Jonah is in timeout. Somebody say timeout. God commissioned Jonah. Let me give you some background for those who may not know Jonah's story. God commissioned Jonah to go to Nineveh. Uh, 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 a heathen nation to preach the word of God to, Gen to uh, Nineveh so that they may accept God. But this is what Jonah did. Jonah had an issue with the people at Nineveh. Jonah was a little prejudiced. And he had a disdain for the people, and out of his disdain for people who were different from him, Jonah refused God's assignment. Anytime you refuse God's assignment on your life, uh, you can best believe that at some point you're going to end up in time out. You all know the story. Jonah <clears throat> refuses God's instructions and he says, no, nah, I'm, I'm up out of here. I ain't going to Nineveh. I'm going somewhere else. And so this is what Brother Jonah did. Brother Jonah jumped on a boat, <clears throat> headed for Tarshish. And while he was on that boat traveling with a bunch of other people, a violent storm arose. And the storm was so violent that the people on the boat began to panic because they understood that if they continued in this storm, uh, that their lives would be in jeopardy. 
Uh, but the Bible says that while the storm was raging, Jonah was asleep. And so they came and they were panicking and they were like, Jonah, get up. And the others were praying to their gods. And when they woke Jonah up, they were like, listen, you need to pray to your God because we about to die up in here. After a while and after some conversation, all of the inhabitants of the boat found out and realized they discovered that this storm was not just any storm. This storm didn't just pop up by happenstance or, or, or uh, circumstance. They discovered that this storm was the result of Jonah's sin and disobedience to God. And so they had to make a decision. And he said, listen, Jonah, you, you the problem. What do we need to do? What, 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 what do we need to do? Because we're about to die because of your disobedience. Finally, they came up with a solution. They said, if we toss Jonah overboard, maybe we, the rest of us, can be saved. And so that's what they did. They tossed Jonah overboard. And, and, and guess what happened when they tossed Jonah overboard? The storm ceased. And so here's Jonah in the middle of the sea, trying to swim, trying not to drown, taking in water, flailing his arms and kicking his feet. And if that wasn't bad enough, here comes a large fish. Some people say Jonah and the whale. That's not what the text says. The text says it was a large fish. And the large fish was on assignment. And eventually what happened is this large fish came, swallowed Jonah whole. Jonah's in time out. Jonah finds himself in a place of confinement. All around him, my brothers and sisters, are dead, rotten carcasses of the fish's last meal. Jonah is in isolation. He can't go nowhere. He can't do anything. All he can do is be still and sit and think about what he's done. I don't know who I'm here for, but I would sermonically suggest to you today that although this appears to be a horrific place, although this big, nasty fish seems to be a horrible place, although sitting in the belly of this fish with all of this rotting and decaying flesh all around Jonah, I would sermonically suggest to you that God sent this big fish not not uh, to kill Jonah, but to save his life. Let me explain. Sometimes God's time out is really a rescue for us. If Jonah had escaped the big fish or if the big fish had never come from God, Jonah probably would have drowned in his sin. But God used the big fish to not only correct Jonah, but God used the big fish to preserve his life. Talk to your neighbor and say, neighbor, your, term, your time out was to save you. Your time out was to preserve you. That place of confinement, that place of stagnation, that place of decay is the reason that you were still here today. Uh, 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 let me see if I can um, uh, make it plain to you. It was because of that time out that you didn't overdose. It's because of that time out that you got out of that abuse, abusive relationship. It's because of that time out that they didn't kill you. It's because of that time out that you didn't lose your mind. It's because of that time out that you didn't go bankrupt this because of that time out that you didn't die in your addiction. If God had not sent a time out scenario for you, it would have killed you. You're here today because God put you in time out. 
not only to teach you and to teach me, but God put us in time out to save us from ourselves. And so what did Brother Jonah do while he was in his time out? Jonah, sit, Jonah sitting there in the stomach of a big fish. What are you going to do? Can't go nowhere. Can't do nothing. The text gives us the reflection of Jonah after he uh, was released from the fish. Obviously, Jonah wasn't sitting in the belly of the fish writing this down. This was after his reflection, after he was delivered from the fish. The first thing that we learn from the text uh, from Brother Jonah is that Jonah speaks of his distress and he prayed. Somebody say prayed. Text tells us that in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me from deep in the realm of the dead. I called for help and he, and you listened to my cry. The language here that is used, and please read the text when you get home uh, so that you can understand where I'm going. The language here that is used is language that has death imagery. Jonah knows he could have drowned. Jonah knows that death was all around him. Jonah knows that he was in the depths of the sea. Even if he had escaped the big fish, like I said, drowning was a near and present threat. Certainly, Jonah had a near-death experience in the natural, but this also points to a spiritual death, a death to self that Jonah also had to go through in his distress. He not only cries out to the Lord, but Jonah does something that we need to learn when we are in our time out experiences. Jonah cries out to the Lord in the midst of death, but he kills his flesh in his time out. He kills his fleshy will in that time out. That was the impetus for him getting in this horrible state in the first place. Remember, I said, God gave Jonah an assignment, and Jonah said, uh -uh, I ain't doing that. That was the impetus. His disobedience was the impetus for which he found himself in the belly of the fish. And so Jonah had to then say, listen, uh, listen, Jonah, because, you know, sometimes you got to talk to yourself. He had to say, listen, Jonah, this is your fault. And we need to correct the mistake that we made. The mistake was we followed after our will and not God's. And so Jonah, in the midst of death, decided to kill his own flesh. The big fish, my brothers and sisters, was the vehicle for Jonah's lesson, but it was also the vehicle for Jonah's deliverance. Jonah had to make the decision in the big fish that he was going to do something different, that he was going to obey God so he didn't find himself in this situation again. Watch this. And he cried out to the Lord in his situation. That big fish, although it was a time out, the big fish then was transformed to a sanctuary where Jonah could pray to his God. And not only a sanctuary, but the big fish then spiritually became an altar where Jonah put his flesh on and sacrificed it. Jonah worshiped in his time out. Remember, Jonah was running from the will of God. He was trying to escape God's assignment because of his own prejudices, yet God in his sovereignty and amazing grace didn't kill Jonah, but he put him in time out so that he could confess, repent, and be restored. I don't know about you today, and again, I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but your time out may be your sanctuary. 
I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's a place that uh, you don't want to be, but your time out can be transformed by the will of God into a place where you can cry out to your God in distress. Your time out may be the place where you put your will on the altar and you crucify your flesh so that God can use you to a greater degree. Your time out may be your opportunity to think about what you have done. Confess, repent, and be restored. Restored. Yeah, time out is a place of confinement. For those of you who have been there, you know it's a place of frustration. Yes, it's a place of inconvenience, but when we consider that the alternative could be death, and because of our sins, we deserve death. Yet God in his mercy uses the time out to give us another chance. I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but I have learned. I thank God for the time out. So let me go on in this journey. I'm going to be done in a few minutes. What time is it? All right. We're going to be out of here by, mid, by noon. What else can we learn about Jonah's time out? Secondly, Jonah's timeout was a place of separation. Not only was it a separation from others, but a spiritual separation from God. Sin will do that. Sin will separate us from God. It will, it will hinder our relationship with God. When Jonah was on the ship, he had company. He had company. He wasn't alone. Although he was disobedient, he wasn't alone. However, his disobedience put others at risk. Did you know that our sin can put others at risk? God had to separate Jonah from everybody so that God could have his undivided attention. The big fish was Jonah's holding cell. That holding cell, my brothers and sisters, became a confessional. I don't know about you, uh, John, you might, uh, you might be able to help me with this, but um, some of you who are familiar with the Catholic faith know that there is, uh, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's the proper term for confessionals? What? For confessing. Confession? Um, confession. Confession. Okay, we're going to work with that. Okay. Uh, they have an ordinance called confessional where you go in this booth. <clears throat> the priest is on the other side. Make sure I'm getting it right. I don't care. Priest is on one side of the booth. You come in on the other side of the booth. There's a sliding panel between both of you. And so you sit there. Okay. You go in the booth. Um, panel slides open. And you say, make sure I get this right, John. Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. Bless That's it. Father, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. See, it's good to have some, some, some Catholics. <laughs> it's been three months. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> okay. So, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been a certain amount of time since my last confession. And then you start telling the priest all your business. <clears throat> Once you finish confessing your sins, then the, the priest instructs you on what to do. Say some Hail Marys and what else is it? Francis, Our Fathers, Hail Marys. Francis, Anything? Father, you still there? <laughs> <laughs> Prayers of reconciliation. Okay. <laughs> our timeouts, our big fishes, should turn into our confessionals. Amen. We have a high priest that sits at the right hand of the Father, Amen. making intercession for us. We don't have to go into a confessional booth to confess our sins to a priest. We have high priest. 
We have a Savior that promises us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, you may find yourself, my brothers and sisters, in a time out, but in that isolated place, in that uncomfortable place, in, in that place, undesirable place, when you find yourself there in that time out, I would admonish you today, transform that big fish to a sanctuary. Make that isolated place your confessional. Cry out to your God because I guarantee you that if you cry out to him with a sincere, repentant heart, God will hear you and he's going to answer your prayer. All right, Brother Jonah, what else do you got for us? What other words of wisdom do you have for us so that we can take it and apply when we find ourselves in our uh, God-ordained timeout? The last thing that I want to share with you, and then I'm going to be out your way. Uh, in that place, in that place of uh, confinement, Jonah makes a promise. Text says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Verse number nine, but I with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. Jonah instructs us not to turn to other means, other methods to get ourselves out of our spiritual timeouts. And saints, y'all know we do that. We try everything under the sun to try to remedy a situation that we caused. We go to Big Mama and Junebug and Shaniqua and Jose and all other kinds of things. We try this and we try that. But Jonah is, is giving us words of wisdom. He's saying, you're going to waste your time trying other things to get out of the situation that only God can release you from. Uh, these things, these other, he refers to them as idols. These things, these other ways, these other means uh, that you may try to get out of your spiritual time outs will only lead to fut fertility, futility, and will exacerbate your already difficult situation. 1 Samuel chapter number 12, verse 21 echoes this wisdom, and it says, do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you because they are useless. Money can't rescue you out of a spiritual time out. Influence can't rescue you out of a spiritual time out. People can't rescue you out of a spiritual time out. Your friends can't rescue you out of a spiritual time out. Guns and weapons can't rescue you out of a spiritual time out. God is the only person that can release you from a time out that he has ordained. So Jonah tells us, listen, don't even waste your time. You in a time out, don't waste your time. Going for idols, trying to do it your way. Because you're just going to end up being frustrated and tired and still in time out. Jonah gives us the alternative. It's found right there in verse 9. Jonah says, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. Jonah has a change of heart in his time out. And his change of heart uh, makes him make a commitment not only to give God exuberant praise, but also sacrifice his will to God. He promises he's going to give God exuberant praise. Because listen, when you understand your time out, and I said it before, when you understand that as horrible as your time out is, it saved your life. When you understand that as inconvenient as your time out is, God ordained it. When you understand that uh, how horrific your time out is, but God is using it to get your attention and to draw you back to him. Why? Because of his love for us. 
When we get to the place where we understand that, we will cease to be frustrated in our time out, and we will begin to be exuberant in praise unto God. Jonah says, I'm going to not only praise God, but I'm a sacrifice. What is he sacrificing? He's sacrificing his will sacrificing his flesh, sacrificing his agenda. The lesson, my brother and sisters, that we learn in our time out must be that we praise God because the time out preserved us from death and that we must present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. One translation says it is our spiritual way of worship. To sacrifice our will and to follow the will of God. I'm almost done. When we make that promise to God in our time out, listen, God responds to our confession. God responds to our repentance. God hears and sees Jonah in the belly of that fish. Jonah has a change of heart. He confesses and he repents. Anytime we come to God, we confess our sins and we repent of our sins. Repentance is not a change of of, uh, action alone. Repentance is a change of heart. And that change of heart leads to changed behavior. God sees Jonah. This is what God does. If you go back to the text, Jonah confesses, he repents. He says, I'm going to praise you, God, and I'm going to bring my flesh under subjection. I'm going to do what you called me to do. As soon as he does that, what did God do? God caused the big fish to vomit him out on dry land. God restores Jonah, and he doesn't just release him from the fish. He releases him in a place of safety, and watch this. He releases him at the place where he can then go and fulfill the will of God that God told him. Jonah comes out of his time out, his solitary confinement, and what does he do? He goes to Nineveh, and he preaches to Nineveh. And guess what happened to Nineveh? They got saved. God moved in the midst, and they got saved. When we as disobedient children, the theologian, and I'll end with this, uh, okay, this statement. When we as disobedient children of God repent of our disobedience, the frowning providence of God that allows our trial or chastening becomes the smiling face of God's marvelous grace. When we learn the lesson of our time out, God will bless us and God will prosper us. Everybody standing and resting on your feet. You may be here today, and we can't assume that everybody that's in church is necessarily in Christ. There is a difference. Being in church means that you're in the physical building. Being in Christ means that you are part of the body of Christ. You have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior by faith through grace. Being in church is nice. 
it's good. It's I, don't don't get me wrong. I'm I'm good to see. I'm glad to see all y'all. I really am. I just want y'all looking good too. Look at you, just looking prosperous. You're looking good. Everybody looks like you know they just got a million dollars in the bank. Y'all look good. But being in church is not enough. Because you could be in church on your way to hell. I used to tell my students when I used to teach middle school and they, found, they knew that I was a preacher and they'd be like, Mr. T, they used to call him Mr. T. Mr. T, I go to church too. I said, oh, that's good. But you do realize demons go to church as well. And so I need to know, are you one of them people that the demons hitch a ride with when you go to church? Are you somebody that really knows the Lord and really loves the Lord and has placed your faith in the Lord? If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, today is the day. This is the time. You are not here by circumstance. You're not here by happenstance. But God has ordained for you to be here on this day to hear this word, to make a decision. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved. Jesus died for our sins on the cross. Everything that we've done, everything we will do, everything that we're doing now, everything that we could possibly think about doing, Jesus died and shed his blood to pay the price. Because the price of sin is death. We should be dead. But Jesus Christ paid that price for us. And so if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can come down to this altar now. You can receive Jesus Christ today. It'll be the best decision that you will ever make. And I guarantee you, it'll be life-changing for you. That's my first appeal. My second appeal is this. You may have already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You may know the Lord. You may have known the Lord for years. But you've kind of strayed away from the church. And we're in a, a we're in an era, an era of errancy where we have come to believe that we can be effective Christians but not have a church home or not be connected to a body of local believers. But the Bible says to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, which even was the habit of some back in the disciples' time. The wonderful thing about a church home is that you have people that can help you build you up, be all that God has called you to be. Every one of us have a calling on our lives to build the kingdom of God. Everybody has an assignment. God has already ordained all of the good works that he has designed you specifically, you and you and you and you designed for you to do and it takes being connected sometimes to figure out what those good works are some of us can testify that there were people in the church that helped and poured into us and spoken to us and said I see God doing this in your life I see God using you this way. And it, it helped us and it confirmed what God was saying and the direction that we were to go in. When you're uh, detached from the body, you don't have that. And it's harder to be where God has called you to be. If you're saved, but you don't have a church home, you don't have a place where you're connected in, we would love for you to join here at Ebenezer Baptist Church. We're not a perfect church, and I say that every single time. 
that we do the invitation. But we're a church that serves a perfect God. And I believe that God is going to do something spectacular, amazing, extraordinary here at Ebenezer Baptist Church. God going to do some wonderful things, and he has already been doing some wonderful things. And we would love to have you with us. And so if you feel the spirit of God drawing you to connect with this local branch of Zion, we will receive you just as you are. You don't have to go home and get nothing together and get it straight and get it. You don't have to do that. Jesus received you on the cross, and we receive you today just as you are. And we will help you and assist you to become all that God has called you to be. Is there one? Come on, let's sing something. Sing. Amen. Amen. Is there another? Is there another? There's still time. Saints of God, God is doing what God said he was going to do. That's why we put reminders up of what God said before the pandemic. And God is bringing the harvest. He's bringing the harvest into this church. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Is there another? Is there another? your desire. Can you sing with us? Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me near, nearer, Dear blessed Lord, precious bleeding side. Can we sing it one more time? Draw me near, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross. Where thou hast died, hold, oh, draw me near, nearer, oh, Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Come on, can we celebrate God? We celebrate the soul that God has sent to our fellowship. Amen. We're going to have uh, the report from our deacon. Use the mic. Pastor. Use the mic. Use the mic. Pastor, church, uh, I present to you Rubina Abatello uh, from Inglewood. She comes to us with Christian experience, 
uh, seeking a new church home. Amen. Yeah, I'm ready to run. Um, Rubina is um, uh, one of the wonderful people that I have met at Bergen Family Center, and we care for your dad. We care for her dad. And um, we had a conversation today, and she approached me, and she's like, what, what church uh, do you pastor? So I told her. And uh, she said, we're looking for a church home. We had a church before, but it's too far, and, and we're looking for something here. And she said, now that I know you, I'm going <laughs> to come to your church. I said, well, come on. And it's just such a blessing. Such a blessing of God. When God adds to the fellowship, and when God confirms what he has said, sometimes God will speak, and it's years before God, well, before we see the manifestation. And sometimes in the waiting, We can say, God, did I really hear you right? Did, are you really going to do this? And every now and then, he reminds us of what he said. And so, Sister Rabina, we're so excited, so happy, so thankful to God that he has drawn you here by his spirit. And I believe that, I know that, God has something special here for you. And he has a work for you to do. And we just want to partner with you as your church family to help you be all that God has created for you to be. I love how God orchestrates our lives, where he puts us in the right place at the right time to meet the right people so that we can start on our destiny. And so after you know, your new members training and um, our new members training instructors, can y'all stand or wave your hands or all of our new member training instructors? Okay, these wonderful women of God are going to teach you about Ebenezer Baptist Church, the vision, the visionary, the vineyard um, here. And after your new members training classes, you'll be a, a official member of the Ebenezer Baptist Church. And I encourage you Number one, first and foremost, you can jump right in. Jump right in, be active. Saints of God, yeah, some of y'all know the ones I put on assignment. Let's uh, embrace Sister Ravina. Let's love on her and let her know that we, we're just so grateful to God for you being a part of us. And, you know, jump into Bible study, which is, is on Zoom. And so, um, you know, you can watch it from home and, and have Mr. Robert there too. And, you know, y'all can just watch Bible study together um, as you care for him and, um, and as we grow together. And so we welcome you again. Uh, we welcome you once, welcome you twice, welcome you three times in the name of Jesus Christ. And we God bless you. Amen. Um, they're going to take you in the back and get some more information from you. Amen. Can we celebrate God one more time? God is adding, adding to the local fellowship. And we are just so grateful, so thankful. 
for what God is doing. What time is it? All right. I'm, I'm a little late, y'all. Y'all, excuse me. I'm a little late. I said we'd be out about 12, but I got to change it. 12.08. We're going to be out by 12.08. Um, Saints of God, we now um, want to give you an opportunity, those uh, who are part of the family and also our visitors, we want to give you an opportunity uh, to bless the Lord in your giving. We know that um, God has been good to us. And we want to expand our ministry. We want to have a greater impact uh, in this community for the cause of Christ. And so um, I am so thankful and grateful for all of the members of Ebenezer Baptist Church uh, that have been faithful in returning the tithe to the Lord and cheerfully giving your offering. For those of you who may be visiting, um, and want to uh, bless this ministry and support this ministry uh, as we do the Lord's work. Uh, we are on the Tidely app. You can find us there, uh, the Ebenezer Baptist Church of Inglewood, New Jersey. You can also uh, send a uh, love offering through PayPal, or uh, if you like something tangible in your hand, uh, there are offering uh, envelopes in the pews there. Uh, you can put your offering in the pew, and when you egress out of the sanctuary, uh, the tithing box is right there in between the two doors. Uh, you could just drop that envelope in the tithing box, and again, saints of God, I am so grateful to all of you for your faithfulness in supporting this ministry financially, and um, again, I believe that God is going to do a great work. I believe that God is going to supply everything that we need, and I believe that God is going to pour out upon us in this church collectively and individually because we've been faithful to him. Um, also, remember the vision that God has placed in this house, uh, that we are empowered disciples equipping God's people to maximize ministry. Um, I've challenged the church family uh, to find out what it is that God has ordained and created for you to do to build the kingdom, uh, get in that place, and serve God um, as unto the Lord and not unto people, um, so that the body of Christ uh, can grow and can work together. Lastly, love one another. Be kind to one another, for it is this, for it is by this all men, women, boys, and girls will know that we are Christ's disciples if we have love one for another. Everybody standing and resting on your feet. Let us pray. Blessed God, we are just elated. First and foremost, we're elated about you. And we're thankful that you are in our lives. We're grateful for your grace. We're grateful for your mercy. We're grateful for the opportunity to come together, oh God, and worship one more time. And oh God, we are also elated for the one on the left, the one on the right, our brothers and sisters, and even the one that you have drawn to this house. You are faithful to what you have spoken, and we are so excited about what you're doing and what you're going to do. And now, oh God, as we leave this place, but never your presence. Keep us, O oh God, as only you can. Shield us from all hurt, harm, or danger. Continue, O oh God, to lead us by your spirit. And O oh God, continue to teach us to be obedient to your will. Lord, we love you and we bless you. In Jesus' mighty name we do pray. Amen and amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful week. Oh!